As you may well know, I've been talking about how what we're currently walking through is much, much bigger than just a standard recession. And a complete economic reset is coming next. Well, this morning, a very interesting article from the IMF came across my desk. And you know what the title was? The Great Reset. In this video, I'm going to show you what she said about the immediate economic future of over 170 countries. And I'll also show you the unfortunate realities which will unfold when desperate governments do desperate things. And knowing what to do will put you back in the driver's seat so your money doesn't disappear during the largest wealth transfer in global history. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the reset that pff, even the IMF is talking about quite openly these days. And so this is the article that came up this morning. And Kristalina Georgieva, who is the managing director of the IMF, gave a speech in front of the World Economic Forum talking about the Great Reset. Now, of course, what she also said in here is that 170 countries are going to finish this year with a smaller economy than at the start of the year. In other words, we are looking at a major global contraction. She said it in a much nicer way than I did. And we are already project that there will be more debt, bigger deficits, and more unemployment. And there is a very high risk of more inequality and more poverty. So what do we know about what's going on right now? We know that during economic crisis, and this is a pandemic uh, as well, that it is the lower levels, the normal public, that suffers far more than the 1% at the top. And it kind of creates like this tinderbox of really negative feelings. And so we know what's happening. Rioting, looting, you know, but if you also remember going into this coronavirus, it really did quelch a lot of the rising protests on a global basis that were happening. And so now people have been home, they've been frustrated. Many of them, as you're gonna see here in a minute, they're still waiting for their unemployment checks and we're talking two, three months out now and things have not really gotten better and they're trying to reopen. But like I said, desperate governments do desperate things. And so into even protesters that are non-violent, not rioting, not looting, not hurting other people. Well, there's been some incidences, I will say that. Additionally, you have the Fed chair. There is no limit. When you hear those words, if you think about it for yourself, whenever I have said there is no limit or at all cost, the cost is typically very dear. So for governments, they are going to try and take as much control as they possibly can. And for central bankers, they are going to print the currency, the fiat money that they create at will into oblivion. And we probably will, well, we already are. What am I saying? Probably. We are already seeing modern money theory in practice because there's an unlimited amount. Now we've talked about the states gradually starting to reopen. 
but with all the rioting and the looting, that's kind of put a little bit of stress on that. Retail's restart halted by unrest. And the other piece that we were going to pay attention to as the, uh, as the reopening unfolded was a spike in cases. But if you've got thousands of people that are coming together, and yes, a lot of them wearing masks, but look, I don't think they're practicing much social distancing. What is that going to do to the new cases of coronavirus and therefore the liftoff of the reopening in the economy? And we certainly knew that not all companies would be lifting off anyway. In the meantime, you have stock markets that are nearing or reaching new highs that were previous, previously held in February. Interestingly enough, though, Goldman Sachs comes out talking about the public pension plans, and they are less than 60% funded on average. Now, there's two pieces to that. If it's a state or a government plan and that loss of tax revenue makes it much harder to fund these plants that were severely underfunded anyway. But what do they put that money into in these fiat products? So why aren't these more funded considering the fact that you've got markets near all time highs or even in some cases making all time highs? Because the difference between those is what Wall Street takes. All of the fees, et cetera. So a big issue for the public sector is not just what's going on with other asset portfolios. That's what we're talking about. But it's in the revenues. And now there seems to be a level of exodus from the cities. And that's going to make it much more difficult. Particularly as example would be New York City that generates 52% of their income from real estate taxes. And if you have people moving out of the city, that's going to hurt that as well. Further than that, the Atlanta Fed are showing according to their GDP now. So they're looking at the, the probable growth and without any of the filters that are put in. And they're looking at a GDP that's dropping 50%. So what does that mean? That means a lot more unemployment. This is not, you know, even if they start to reopen, this isn't going to make magically things magically better. This is the savings rate. So all of those $1,200 checks that went out, all of that extra unemployment insurance that people are getting, well, this is the monetary velocity. So how quickly money is changing hands are people spending this money. And this is the savings rate that spiked to 33% from not even 10%. It looks like about 7 or 8%. 33%. So until people feel like they're going to get it every single month, it looks like they are way too nervous. All those jobs that they thought were temporary layoffs, well, a lot of them don't look like temporary layoffs. So I want you to just kind of think about this. At the start of the coronavirus crisis, Russia and Saudi Arabia declared an oil war. The timing was incredible, seriously. Now, as we're coming to this, we know that in Washington, they're thinking about delisting a lot of Chinese stocks. And I'll talk more about this tomorrow. But uh, the White House came out today and started talking about disallowing flights from China into the U.S. So we've got a war. That war between the U.S. and China is still brewing, maybe a cold war, but you know, truthfully, stashing some gold. Now, I've been telling you for a long time that I personally believe that the government will do an overt confiscation of gold. That's why I don't buy bullion. That's why I buy the collectibles. Because my uncle was able to have many ounces. I don't really know exactly how many because I didn't count. I'm guessing 
3,000 ounces. They had two huge floor safes and you couldn't put a gold coin in there. But they were pre-33s at a time when you couldn't hold five, more than five ounces of gold. That had a huge impression on me, even though I certainly didn't understand it as a 10-year-old child. I mean, I didn't really understand that. But now you have others that are starting to talk about the possibility of confiscation. Would you run that Kramer soundbite, please? See if this works. It's a new thing we're trying. Is it going to work? <laughs> yes, no? Well, we'll come back to that. We'll okay, well, actually, then let me just run it on my phone. Let me just find it. Because I know there's lots on here. Because <laughs> I capture a lot. But even Jim Kramer. Well, whoever gets to, here we go. Nope, that's not it. There we go, I got it. Let me make sure the sound is all the way up. Yeah, I want to emphasize super huge. Uh, the Treasury Secretary, President, let's not use 1.2 trillion. Let's just say, you know what number we were gonna use? We're gonna use the number that makes it so that 100 million people don't get thrown out of work. That's our number. And when we figure out how much uh, after it costs to do that, and then we're going to reassemble. Because think about what happened with China. They got there. Think about what happens if Gilead's drug works, if Regeneron's drug works. Uh, think about what happens if the J&J &J project works. Those are going to. These are our Manhattan project I people. Might not have gotten the right clip. People who will have their savings in the stock market destroyed unless we throw trillions at this. Let's think about the retired people. Let's think about the people yeah, who are fixed think about income the retired people. no income and recognize that this is, a, a, this is no different from 1933, except for please don't confiscate our gold, as the president did then. So there you have it from Jim Cramer and also from, and I, I'm sorry I didn't even capture his name. Forgive me on that one, but you've got the link so you can follow it. But what he says is, it is no surprise that people are buying gold, but the authorities may attempt at some point to demonetize gold. Well, gold is already officially demonetized, but it's been money for 6,000 years, so that part doesn't really make matter. Making it illegal to own as a private individual. They will only do this if they feel the need to create a stable unit of account for world trade. In other words, this has happened well over 4,800 times. When we go into this new economic and monetary regime, and we have to, there is no choice. It should be pretty obvious to everybody, there is no choice about that. But by the time we do that, people are beaten and bloodied and bruised enough, they're desperate enough, they're gonna have to back the, the new coins, the new money with gold. That has happened every single time. So, you know, can I guarantee it one way or the other? No, I can't guarantee it one way or another. But desperate governments do desperate things and look at how desperate everybody is. Now there's something else that's been coming up and I find this really, really interesting because I've talked about it a lot. I can't even tell you how happy I am that I'm 65 and I got to live through what happened in the 70s. Because maybe people don't remember and we're looking at the riots and the people that are getting hurt and killed today. My sister, was at Kent State and she got billy clubbed. And I remember that. And so when I was talking about it with somebody, um, I actually pulled it up. So the Kent State shootings, anybody that was around back in 1970, they'll remember this for sure. Also known as the May 4th massacre or the Kent State massacre were the shootings of 13 unarmed Kent State University students in Kent, Ohio by the Ohio National Guard. And that was May 4th of 1970. Now, interestingly enough, I'm going to play this uh, soundbite as well. Yesterday morning when I was listening to CNBC, they had Art Cashin on. And if you know who he is, he's with UBS, but he's 
I think even actually older than I am. So let me play this sound bite because I thought, yes. Question about the disconnect between the markets and the social unrest. I'm not trying to date you, but I think in 1964 you were already a member of the NYSE. And I wonder, either in 64 or 68, did that disconnect feel as profound as it feels right now? Well, it did. It, 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 thank you for remembering. Yes, I was there in swaddling clothes. Uh, but um, it, it certainly in it, it, 64 to some degree, and 68 was a, a terrible era in which uh, the demonstrations, uh, again, uh, turned partially economic with, with uh, looting and other things, and that resulted in a major... Uh, city riots, uh, some of what we're hearing about today, the National Guard coming in, and that then did morph into a bit of an economic setback as, as the economy it struggled. Work. It didn't um, plunge the stock market, but it, it uh, uh, set the economy back, and then major cities like Detroit and Newark and others uh, actually have not come back uh, from the... the uh, response that they had to the social unrest in, in 68 and so on. So let us hope that it is nowhere near that. Yes, uh, I've been around long enough to have that memory. And that's why I can tell you for now, uh, it, it looks a little bit less spontaneous and uh, more uh, structural in, in that uh, certain interest groups uh, seem to be involved. Should that change? Uh, then I think it would have a major impact on the economy. So I think what we've got to look at here, the stock market probably in an area um, where the averages are due for a bit of a rest. If that rest turns into a pullback, then things are turning differently. But uh, uh, yes, you're right to remember the 60s were uh, um, a dreadful time sociologically, and it did have an impact on the market. So here's the other piece of that. I was talking to my sister and brother-in-law last night, and I asked them, so I'm going to ask anybody out there that also lived during this period of time and to please share this with everybody else. Does not the energy that is surrounding us right now with all of the chaos that's going on, does this not feel the same way that it did in the 60s and the 70s when we were then transitioning into a new monetary regime shift? Because it was 1971 when they took gold out of the currency completely. So 33, they took it away from the normal citizen and that enabled the government to grow a whole lot more debt, gave them a whole lot more control, and to devalue the currency. In 71, they disallowed other countries from converting their dollars into gold and handed over the whole, the whole piece of guiding inflation to private central bankers. Now we're going into a new regime. I did a piece on just before the crash. I'm telling you, this is what it looks like. This is the stock market. This is the Dow going into 1965, 1966. And here it is in 1970, 71. But look at this. The markets were making new highs and there was a lot of civil unrest. I mean, Martin Luther King, civil rights, women's lib, the oil embargo. Then, of course, the markets did implode, and they will again. But this is what happens during those periods of time. This is global, though, and I don't want you to lose sight of that because we're fighting battles on so many fronts. Absolutely, with China, we're in a Cold War with them. And we'll see what happens with that, but I don't think that piece is going to end well. But now, TV crew, this was an Australian TV crew that was injured by police, even though they identified themselves, and now Australia is opening an investigation into the U.S. violence against journalists trying to cover the protests. Freedom of speech? 
You've got thousands that are rallying in Paris. You've got thousands that are rallying in London and probably a whole lot more than what I'm actually seeing. And, you know, it is really the same kind of stuff because what they did, what the central bankers did was make sure that the corporations, boy, they were lickety split on getting them funding. Not so much with the little guys. Now, I actually didn't mean to have this in there, but frankly, when I'm getting ready to come on air and I'm listening and I'm paying attention and something comes up, I grab it and I throw it on a slide. So I might not have actually chosen to go live with this, but I think it's really important anyway because the CARES Act was supposed to give relief, but really so far, it's just been the big cities that have gotten some level of relief. A lot of the smaller towns and cities are still left holding the bag. And particularly with income from, from taxes down, whether it's employment taxes or property taxes, everything on hold, this creates a huge problem because how are they going to pay our police, our teachers, our, you know, et cetera. How are they going to pay them if they do not have the income and the federal government is not really being so forthcoming in helping? They're not, just in some places. And that's always been the case. You've got some entities that get a first and they're the big ones and those are the ones that have the most pull. And then the other ones, maybe they get it, maybe they don't. And when I say that, here's your unemployment numbers. More than 40 million people have filed for unemployment. Doesn't mean that that's everybody that's, that's unemployed. Just means that's how many have filed for unemployment. And yet you have almost a third of them that have not been paid yet. And I happen to know somebody personally that is in that boat. So let's see, they file for unemployment in mid-March. Here we are in June. You think that might create a little bit of a problem? But in the meantime, what happens? The markets rage on because there's a complete disconnect. Now they keep asking, gee, why are these markets going up? And then they're gonna say something when you listen to the talking heads. And then you hear them say something like, well, it's the monetary stimulus. Well, yeah, look at how much these European banks have rallied just today, 4%, 3%, because ECB is set to inject a lot more stimulus, in other words, print a whole lot more money. This is where the markets closed. This was today. So at the time that I did it, I think they actually closed a little bit higher than this, right? That makes a whole lot of sense. Does anybody know how much any of these companies are going to make? No, because nobody really knows the economic fallout from the choice to shut down the global economy yet and the economic fallout from over 40 million people being out of work. We're a consumer-driven economy and frankly, in a consumer-driven world. These are all of the programs that the Fed, well, there's probably some more too, but all of the programs that the Federal Reserve has created or reinstated, you know, TALF, MELF, MISMELF, Pupple mouth. I mean, it, it's just a vegetable soup and it's all garbage and it's all around creating more debt because that's really what the central bank can do. Here we go, over 7 trillion. Now, this is the graph of the, you've seen this a hundred times or more. This is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. This is the crisis right here. Certainly, it's pretty obvious that what they've done to date dwarfs what they did in 2008. And then, of course, you had all the stimulus. And this is when they try to normalize. But remember, this did not start with the coronavirus. We saw the system freeze in September. Central banks will do anything that they can to keep this game going until they have the new currency and the new system in, in place. 
So we haven't felt even nearly the pain that we're about to feel. But it kind of feels maybe even a little calmer today from the rioting. You know, I might not. They might want to cut, cut this out. Maybe I shouldn't say it. But I will tell you this. I was pretty nervous the other day. And I heard a lot of helicopters going around above my house. And I actually slept with a gun in my bed. I actually did. But I have a lot of security around here. And of course, I have my Daisy May, the big English Mastiff. So I wasn't, I wasn't really scared, but I did that just in case. You've got the Bank of England now starting to contemplate negative rates. And no matter how much they say, oh no, oh no, oh no, there's not going to be any choice, and there's not going to be any choice for the Federal Reserve either. You mark my words, we will see negative rates in the U.S., absolutely. And as these markets rage, what are the insiders doing? Oh, there's Moderna. Executives have cashed out $89 million in shares this year as the stock price has soared on vaccine hopes. The insiders are getting out. If they really had hopes of a vaccine over at Moderna, why, why would you liquidate the stock? Why would you do that? You wouldn't. You would want to hold on to it. Additionally, pending sales of existing homes collapse. But because they've put the laws in place so that they don't have to do an appraisal for 120 days after the close, what are those people going to see that bought the house, that bought property now in 120 days? You think that everything that's going on is really going to support home prices staying like this and even moving up in some cases? No, it's insanity. If people are out of work, they can't buy a new house. Although they'll let you buy a new car and you won't have to pay for it for 90 days. What happens if, God forbid, I'm sorry, poi, 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 you don't get your job back. How are you going to pay for that car? It so creates a problem with used cars out there as well. I mean, come on. The, you know, take your pick. This is significant in that U.S. money market funds, we've been talking about money market funds hot and heavy since September. They're waiving fees to stave off negative returns. But they're going to come to a point when even if they're not making, they're not charging you fees, you're still going to get negative returns because they changed the rules in 2008 when the money markets funds froze to make it a lot more difficult or to inspire you to keep your money in the money markets. And there's been pro people ask me all the time, what about money markets? I don't own any money markets. Well, you don't really own them anyway. You own a contract. But things are not going to be getting very a whole lot better. According to analysts at TD Securities, negative interest rates could cause the sector to shutter. <laughs> Close. We're going into negative rate territory. Why would you want to hold it? Unless regulations are changed. Yeah, well, they did that in 2008 when the money markets froze. And they changed the regulations. They didn't change the behavior. That is typically what they do. And finally, I mean, there are so many different things that are happening in China, but to revoke Hong Kong trade privileges in China escalation as China is using the coronavirus to go in and clamp down on democracy protesters and to take back control, or to take control, I should say, of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is no longer autonomous from China. Shocker. And today, so I pulled this up today. This just happened. They ban China flights amid tensions. This, this starts June 16th. Four Chinese airlines cuts China U.S. passenger service. Now, U.S. airlines, Delta United American, have stopped China flights since January 31st. And so there's a sticking point here because obviously the coronavirus is why they stopped the flights in January. But they want to resume flight, flying. 
So, you know, you've got a lot of conflict that's going on all around the world that the U.S. is right in the middle of. And finally, this wall of worry. What, what are we dealing with here? And actually, there's even more of this. The coronavirus, China, U.S. tensions, social unrest. How about what's happening in the oil patch and all of the bankruptcies? How about what's happening in, you know, with unemployment aside from the social unrest? There's a lot that's going on. This sure feels a whole lot like the 60s and 70s to me, as I can remember them. Did anybody else say that they remembered that as well? So there were a lot of other people out there. Yeah, if you live there. And that energy, it feels the same. And in the meantime, you've got the Dow up from March 23rd lows, 43%, 42%. The NASDAQ's up 45%. It's insanity. And it is just a trap because a lot of what's pushing those markets, I mean, primarily what's pushing those markets up are all of the liquidity from all of the global central banks. But the other part is the retail investors. This is a sucker's rally. Please do not be a sucker. Please do not be a sucker. Use this opportunity to build your position. If you've got fiat that you can spare, buy gold buy silver. Do this while you can. Look at what your holes were when everybody was first panicking because of the pandemic. What holes do you need to fill? Food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. I don't care what's happening in the economy. Things can be great. Things can be awful, but you need those things in order to be comfortable. Where were your holes? Fill them up. Use this opportunity. This may be, I don't know, but we saw how tight gold got. We see how tight gold and silver is. It's loosened a little bit. Use this opportunity to lay in your position. Do not wait because things are going to get a whole lot worse. Not every shoe has fallen in here. And Tony uh, Tinoco asks, whom will decide to execute a confiscation of bullion? And why can't we, <laughs> why can't we simply ask them if they plan to? All right, this would be a combination uh, of the central bank and the government making the choice to do a confiscation. And actually, there was an excellent piece, and I'll, I've got some of those links, so I'll pull them up and we'll post those. Um, Gata, and we should see if we can get him on. Um, Gata actually did ask, and it was a very interesting dialogue. There's like three or four or five letters. I haven't read it in a while. Um, and they hold the right to, but they're not going to come out and tell you to that this is what they're going to do. You're not going to know until you wake up one morning and it will be done. And Craig Weber asks, can a government confiscate gold bullion in other countries mint? Is gold, i.e. gold eagles in Canada or vice versa? Well, you know, we're going to kind of see how that works uh, because there are some people that don't think so. However, if push comes to shove in this war between the U.S. and China, and China, I mean, do you really think we know how much gold China's accumulating? Because no gold leaves their country. And so we don't really know how much they have. And what do you think might happen if they actually decided to weaponize the gold after they deal with the debt? They cannot do this before they burn off, hyperinflate their currency and burn off that debt. But what if after they did that, they chose to back the currency with gold? Might that not force the U.S. to prove how much gold they actually have? And then who's the most powerful player in the land? Because apparently the West, the U.S. and Canada, you know, I mean, Canada has no gold at all. And the U.S., 
their holdings haven't changed even one sixteenth of an ounce since I think 1952 or 1954 or something like that. So do you believe it with all the programs and the leasing and the this, et cetera? We had a great discussion on that yesterday on uh, with Egon. So you might want to listen to that if you haven't. But, you know, would they, could they do it? Well, yeah. Do, don't you remember? Everybody's got to report globally. So it doesn't matter where you're holding your wealth. Now, we'll have to see what happens, but governments can do anything that they want. And I don't know who's going to stand up to them. You know, are you going to trust a vault to? So I would trust myself to more than, and I'm not, I'm, I'm definitely not promoting civil disobedience. So please do not misunderstand that. But if you don't hold it, you don't own it. So I hold my gold in a private vault that I can walk to. There are lots of ways to hold it, but you want it, in my opinion, you want it close to you. You want to have access to it when you need it. And Robert Jones asks, okay, oh, how did Uncle Al legally keep all that gold? This is a great question, Robert. And it was simple. He simply made sure, he was, an, he was a major antique dealer, very high-end antique dealer. So he was going into a lot of wealthy homes and he would buy the pre-33 gold coins. And because in 1933, in that executive order, they actually made those coins exempt from confiscation. So that's how he was able to do that legally. And as long as that was legal, that means that he could use them in the normal marketplace. So while I cannot guarantee, I mean, my personal opinion is they've been confiscating your wealth since the day you were born through inflation. And so it's hard for me to imagine that at the very end they're going to go, but you can keep your wealth. I don't think so. So I personally like the pre-33 coins because virtually they've been, they've been selling. And remember, I've been accumulating for a while, for a long time. But they've been selling at almost no premium. And certainly they're still not, they're not near their 1989 premium highs. So that's where I don't care if I'm right. I don't care if I'm wrong. Because even though I'm not spending $8 million on, the, on a coin, I am in the same classification as somebody that does spend $8 million on one ounce of gold. And I can't guarantee this either, but I kind of feel like if somebody can afford $8 million for one ounce of gold, well, they either get to write the laws or perhaps influence those that can write the laws. And we certainly know how strong lobbyists are. So that's it for today. But this week I was on with Eric at Tradcat Night and, and he it was really an excellent, excellent interview. So we covered a lot of material, a lot more than what we covered today. And is it is it posted already? It's not posted yet, but stay tuned to the social media. Oh, it was live? Oh, okay. So we do have the link to it. So we did that live. And if we don't have the link, we'll get the link. So we'll just follow up on that. I'll tell you what. Jacqueline has the most expressive face of anybody I have ever met. And so sometimes she's over there and she's making all these faces. And I don't really know if it's something I'm supposed to pay attention to or she's just responding to something. <laughs> okay. But uh, definitely, again, you know, we did, uh, Egan and I were live yesterday morning. And I'm telling you, if I could have walked through that screen and been in Switzerland where he was, I would have totally done it. It was gorgeous right in front of the Matterhorn. I mean, it was gorgeous. But aside from that, we had really, really excellent discussion um, on, on gold and many things. And you need to watch that if you haven't. Next week, I'm going to be with my good friend Tony at a minute to midnight. So he's over in New Zealand. If you have any questions about this or anything else, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. All of the links and the images you'll find on our blog. 
itmtrading.com forward slash blog. This, of course, will also be posted on Brighteon and Facebook too, right? And if you, you know, if you want to talk to one of our consultants and our strategy specialists, just give us a call or go to and click that Calendly link below. You can set a time. If a time isn't available, then you can call us. But, you know, we like human contact and we really like to get to know our, our clients so that we can really be of full service. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Go ahead and subscribe, hit that little bell. We'll let you know when we're going live and however we can be of service, you know, we're really happy to be. So keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver in your possession. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.